Greetings to our fellow National After School colleagues. Um, I'm Stephen Brawley, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Courtney Dowdle, and we will be presenting today on rethinking the pretest, post test survey design How Do You Know What You Don't Know? Um, we're privileged and honored to be representing an organization in St. Louis. Um, our name is Area Resources for Community and Human Services. Our acronym is ARCHES. We are a unique funding intermediary, and we'll get um, into some more details about us in just a minute. We'll be specifically talking about one of the programs that we um, provide strategic funding to and strategic enhancement to, and that is a nutrition program that we provide to 29 after-school locations that we support. And um, my colleague, um, Courtney, will be getting into details on how do we um, address the challenges of measuring an impact of a program such as Operation Chef, especially since it um, supports um, a variety of very young children, and how do we best work with them to get a measure and report on the program's impact. So let me provide an overview about ARCHES here in St. Louis. We are a unique funding intermediary, which means that we um, do not provide direct services. Um, we actually um, receive our funding from a variety of state and federal agencies, as well as private organizations. So we serve as a funder, but what makes us different is the um, very strategic and deliberate um, enhancement of technical assistance and professional um, development that we provide our funded agencies. So um, the funder, let's say it's the state of Missouri, will provide us with funding for a specific program. In this case, it would be school-age programming in K-12. And in this instance, we're talking about our after-school programming. Um, Arches currently is funding 29 after-school locations throughout the St. Louis region. We're the largest provider of after-school services in the region. And our network um, provides nearly 2,000 students a day with after-school um, services. One of the things that Arches does is add um, enhanced programming to our initiatives, and that includes the program we'll be discussing today. Um, Operation Chef is a program offered by a local organization called Operation Food Search, and they provide nutritional programming for students. So today, as we talk about Operation Chef, um, realize that Arches is not actually delivering the service directly, but we're the ones that have um, secured the funding, secured the expertise of the service, and are making sure the program is being delivered to the students um, in the after-school network. So um, that's just an example of Arch Arches taking a very proactive approach to building relationships. As part of Arches' work, we provide funding, resources, and expertise that really strengthen our funded partners' work. And so that is beyond just writing them a check and, and receiving a report. And um, we're really engaged with the funded agencies that we work with. Arches currently has a network of around 30 funded initiatives that range from early childhood um, to school age to family support services. And that includes another um, an increased network of, 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 a, of at least 200 community partners that we bring to the table. An example of that would be the Operation Chef program. As you well know, um, we have to clearly document our work to um, provide feedback and information to the folks that fund us. So the state of Missouri in this instance will want to know, um, we've given you this funding and we've given you the following objectives, um, how to go. So um, we work um, to um, provide our funders with a variety of insights on our activities, our outputs, our outcomes, and how do we leverage our funding and how do we tell our stories of success. So today we'll be talking again about Operation Chef and we'll be um, showing you how we are working to um, document that work through a variety of, um, of mechanisms um, and that we will be sharing this um, information not only to our funders but to each other. So our network of 29 after school locations um, as well as our um, after school staff we want to make sure they're part of the of the learning process. So what, whatever, whatever we're learning, whatever lessons learned, that we can provide any best practices that we can offer will um, inform um, ways to um, either um, improve the program or take the program to another level using the um, feedback and activities that we've been involved in. And so that's exciting. 
It's now my pleasure to um, hand over the presentation to my colleague, Dr. Courtney Dowdle, ARCH's Director of Research and Evaluation, who will go into greater detail regarding our Operation Chef program and ways we're looking to improve its evaluation efforts. Thanks a lot. The program we will be looking at today is Operation Chef Culinary Habits to Empower Families. This program is offered in each of our 29 funded after-school locations, and the program offers six weekly sessions with about two hours per session, engaging students ages 8 to 12. Now, the sessions include hands-on cooking and nutrition lessons so that students learn how to make a healthy snack by themselves, understand nutritious foods such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and learn how to make healthy food choices. Now, the program has gone through some revisions since its inception, made possible through our collaboration with the provider, Operation Food Search. We collected feedback in a focus group after year one and made some significant changes for year two. We decided to revise the program to be more hands-on and interactive, less lecture style. After a full day of school, kids really needed a break from that sit and listen style learning. So the curriculum was revamped to weave nutrition lessons in with cooking activities. The program was very popular with students as well as parents, and we suspected it would have a positive impact on youth in terms of their ability to make a healthy snack by themselves, their understanding of nutritious foods, and their ability to make healthy food choices. However, when we looked at survey results, the outcomes were erratic, and in some cases they were actually negative. And we'll take a look at a few examples now from year one surveys. So here's one year one example. Um, the statement for students here was, how do you feel about eating vegetables? And students were asked to select either, I like to eat vegetables often, I sometimes like to eat vegetables, I do not like to eat vegetables. Now looking at the top pie chart, the pretest, we see 38.7% said they like to eat vegetables often. And what we would hope to see, we would expect to see in the post-test, is that blue slice, which represents I like to eat vegetables often, we would expect to see that get bigger. Students learn more about the importance of vegetables for nutrition. They've tried some new vegetables. They're more open to eating vegetables. Instead, we saw the percent of students who say they like to eat vegetables often went down. Similarly, in a question about how do you feel about eating fruits, we would expect to see an increase in students who say they like to eat fruits often. Not a difference of 1.5% fewer students saying they like to eat fruits often. Now in some instances we did see gains, but not nearly what we would, ex we would expect given how many students had little to no experience with these skills prior to the class. When asked if they can read a recipe and follow instructions, 83.8% of students responded, yes, I can, in the pretest. That's pretty high. In the post-test, we had an increase of 1.3% students now agreeing they can read a recipe and follow instructions. It's a much more modest gain than we would expect after six weeks of careful recipe reading and instruction following, but then again, we started with 83.8% agreeing. Now, knife skills and safety is where we really knew something was amiss. In the pretest, we saw 84.9% of students respond, yes, I can handle a knife safely. However, one of the major revisions for year two was to include a more in-depth knife safety lesson and use of plastic knives only because in year one, we actually had a couple of incidents where children were cut during prep work due to knife mishandling. So to see that number so high at the beginning and know that there were some minor cuts during the class and then see the post-test score increase by only 3.4%, we became very suspicious that something was off in our measurement. 
based on our observation of student skills and our knowledge of their program experience, we would expect the pretest scores to be much lower and the post-test to show a much bigger increase in knife safety skills. So this is the point in the presentation when we would turn to the audience and ask, has anyone had this happen? Where your survey results appear to say your program has made things worse rather than better? And how did you handle it? For our part, we tended to report on the post-only results, giving a snapshot of how many students agreed with these statements in the post-test only. But that's not really talking about change. That's not a comparison with the pretest, and it's basically throwing all that pretest time and effort in the garbage. I felt like we were really selling the program short and not doing it justice. It didn't make sense with what we knew and saw and heard from the students and their parents every day. We've seen kids in these classes remind each other about safe knife handling. We've seen them, in the course of a single workshop, go from, ew, I don't like beans, to asking for more beans and getting creative with food combinations. So we knew the data we were capturing just weren't valid and were an inaccurate reflection of what was happening in the class. So we reconsidered the instrument we had been using for measuring program impact. The survey had been given as a pretest at the beginning of workshop number one and a post-test at the end of workshop number six. And you can see here how the questions were presented. Students were given this sheet of paper to fill out independently with some reading help from the staff if needed. And there are some real challenges to conducting this type of survey in this manner. The survey taking process was disruptive and time consuming. Students in the program are at least eight years old, but we still had students struggling to read and comprehend the questions. Program staff were sitting down to read items to students one by one if they requested help. If they were too embarrassed to ask for help, they would just stumble their way through and guess at the questions and their meaning and their response options. And we couldn't guarantee any standard type of facilities in the school would be used. So sometimes these surveys were done in the middle of the cafeteria with any manner of other activities going on around them. And we had already made changes to the curriculum so they could dedicate as much class time as possible to hands-on learning. We didn't want to eat up any more of that time with survey taking. The original survey had yes, no, sometimes options. So they were kind of all or nothing. Either the students liked eating whole grains every day or they didn't. On this three point scale, there was no room for budging a little in your attitude, but still not being 100% on board. To see a change, you would have to have a pretty radical shift in attitude. And that's asking a lot of young people and putting a lot of pressure on program staff to change hearts and minds dramatically in the course of six workshops. We wanted to give the students a little more room for nuance in their knowledge and attitudes by expanding that three-point scale a bit. Furthermore, knowing what we know about young people and what we know about our historically underserved populations in particular, this was an unfair question to the students as well as the program staff. This question is phrased as an assessment of behavior, but students don't have to like eating healthy every day to know it's important. They may like to and can't for a variety of reasons, or they may have no idea if they like it because they don't have the opportunity to do it. So we wanted to turn these questions to focus more on changes in knowledge and attitude. What are they learning and how does it affect their attitude towards the idea of healthy eating? Finally, as we saw, the results of the survey were all over the place. We could tell we had problems with validity because sometimes our results showed positive impact, albeit very minimally, or no impact at all, likely due to that three-point scale. And sometimes the results actually showed negative impact, meaning the students were actually less informed about nutrition and less interested in healthy eating at the end of the program. So 
As I said, we ended up reporting on those post-test scores alone. The pre-test was essentially a waste of time and a real drag of a way to start a program that's going to be a really fun class. We knew the program was having some kind of positive impact on youth, but we clearly were not capturing that impact. As we mentioned, the program was very popular with students as well as parents, and we usually maxed out our registration with requests to repeat the class. So we suspected we had a problem with data validity. And we believed a lot of that problem could be attributed to response shift bias. Response shift bias can occur when people begin a program with limited knowledge about the program content, which prevents them from accurately self-assessing their knowledge, skills, behavior, attitudes, etc. At the beginning of a program, people don't know yet what they don't know, so they tend to over or underestimate their abilities or familiarity with a subject. At the end of the program, they have a much better understanding of how much they had yet to learn. They have a better informed perspective on how their behavior or attitudes fit on a scale. But if the program used a pretest, they have no way of adjusting their responses in light of this new information. Like we saw here, where students rated themselves pretty darn high to begin with, and their post test scores were pretty much the same as the pretest. As a result of response shift bias, program effects are distorted. For example, say I'm taking an Excel basics class. If you asked me before class, on a scale of 1 to 10, how competent an Excel user am I, I might give myself a 7 or 8 as a competent Excel user, based on how I use it right now. <clears throat> that is, until I take a course and realize quickly just how many features and tools and shortcuts are available that I have not been using. At the end of the class, I might give myself a 7 or an 8 now that I'm fully aware of all Excel has to offer and have mastered a lot of it. I might like to go back in time and change my initial rating to something more like a 4 or a 5 since I now realize I had no idea all the knowledge and skills I was missing when I knocked, walked into the class. But a pretest post test design doesn't allow for this reflection and perspective. So I erroneously gave myself a seven in the pretest and give myself a seven in the post test because I now know a ton, but I also know there are still a lot of features I haven't tapped into yet. I learned a ton in that course, but my pretest post test scores would suggest I didn't learn a thing. And again, students overwhelmingly agreed in the, pro in the pretest, yes, I can use a knife safely, but we know they were cutting themselves and learning lots of new things before they finally, again, overwhelmingly agreed in the post-test with pretty much the same score, yes, I can use a knife safely. So this is where a post-then pre-design can solve a lot of problems and provide a more accurate opportunity for self-assessment. Also called a retrospective pre-post design, this structure asks participants to measure their learning only at the end of the program. It collects both before and after ratings at the same time, so participants can gauge their own progress with the full understanding of what is to be learned. Research shows that a retrospective post-then pre-design increases the validity of data collected for this type of research, questions asking about knowledge, awareness, skills, confidence, attitudes, behaviors, etc. Asking someone to gauge their own change over time, knowing what you know now, is an opportunity for a more accurate self-assessment of change. And research shows the self-assessment ratings in a post-then pre-design are more consistent with more objective measures of progress, like observations from trained judges or performance testing. And it has a number of other advantages over the pretest post test design. It decreases vulnerability. It avoids the pitfalls of attrition if the participants at the end of the program are not an exact match for those who were present at the beginning. It maximizes activity time. 
It takes much less time to complete a single post-then pretest at the end of the program than it would to conduct two tests, one at program start, one at program completion. This lets you focus more time on activities, which is really important to keeping students on track. It adds versatility. It allows time to adjust the instrument if certain program features become more or less significant through the course of the program. So maybe you realize that students are spending more time talking with their families about food and nutrition as a result of the class, and you want to capture that too. You can add questions about unanticipated benefits into the post-test, and you won't have missed the opportunity to capture that change just because it wasn't anticipated and therefore wasn't included in the pretest. And it increases openness. Participants may be more willing to admit to certain behaviors at the end of the program once that behavior is in the past. For Operation Chef, we implemented some survey changes, and while the process is still not perfect, we have seen a dramatic change in the types of results we are able to report. We now conduct only one survey with the students at the start of workshop number six. In addition to the retrospective post then pre survey design, we also move the scale to a five point scale so students have more room to grow and change. And we've added emojis to the scale so students have a clearer idea of how to interpret the text responses, whether they are positive or negative. And here you see students on the last day of class, workshop number six. First, they play some fun trivia and review what they've learned. They get really excited to participate and answer questions. They compete in teams, they win prizes. Spoiler alert, it's always a tie. And just after trivia, they take their survey. So it's sandwiched in between fun and engaging activities. So they get a little excitement, then slow it down a notch to read and answer a few questions, then they get to cooking. It's a much better use of their time and it's much easier on program staff to manage the moods and needs of students in this way. And as a result, we are able to report very differently than before. We can now compare the average before score and the average after or today score. We look at the average rating students gave before for each before item and compare it to the average rating they give each today version of the question. We can look item by item and show how much the rating changed and talk about the percent increase in today versus before ratings. We can also look at the number of students who gave each item a positive rating. So a uh, four to five on the scale, that's equivalent to a, a pretty good or awesome, or a sure or yes please rating. And we can look at how many students gave a positive rating for today versus before. So here we are looking at the, how good were you at making something to eat by yourself question. Students self-assessed themselves at a 3.7 before they came to class. That's somewhere between okay and pretty good. Students rated themselves at 4.4 today after taking the class. That's between pretty good and awesome. It's a 0.7 increase in their self-assessment rating, and it's a 19% increase in scores. Compare that with the results of our previous instrument, and it tells quite a different story. The previous instrument results in a positive difference of 1.3% between students who agree they can make a recipe and follow instructions before and after class. And this is just a 1.5% increase in scores. Revisiting that knife safety question, we see in the bottom table a difference of 36 students self-rating their knife skills as pretty good or awesome before the class, and 49 students rating themselves as pretty good or awesome today after the class. That's a 43% change in students giving themselves a positive rating compared with a 
3.4% increase in scores using the old instrument. Again, it's quite a different story to tell. And we can visualize these changes in bar charts that show the difference in between the difference in before ratings and today ratings. So the growth is really apparent. In addition, we provide our staff and providers with some text examples for how to talk about the results. For example, we can say, when asked how they felt before versus after the session, students rated their ability to use a knife safely an average of 0.9 points higher after the final session. And 57% more students felt pretty good or awesome about their ability to make something to eat by themselves. That's up from 57.3% of students to 90.2% of students. Of course, as with anything, there are some limitations to a retrospective post-then pre-design, but many of these apply to a pre-test, post-test design as well. Self-reporting, for example. This instrument is asking students to evaluate themselves, their knowledge, their skills, their behavior, their attitudes. Now, this limitation also applies to a pre-test, post-test design, but this is to say the post-then pre-design still has this concern. Um, there's potential acquiescence or social desirability bias. In adults especially, we worry that participants may want to see some results for their time spent, and this could influence their response. This might be less a problem for young people, but they may still fall into a pattern of rating all the afters as higher than the befores. Of course, we acknowledge this possibility in our findings, but we also use the open-ended responses to support our claims that students are more skilled or knowledgeable or more open to new foods after the class. So when we analyze those responses and see multiple students list pinch and claw or slice and dice as their favorite thing they learned, we know that the knife skills lesson really was impacting. Um, this is recall data. It does ask students to think about themselves in the past, their knowledge, skills, behavior, attitude in the past. And accurate recall data is difficult to collect, even from grown-ups, unless you have clear anchors in time. And think about the difference between asking someone to recall the last time you went to the store versus the times you've gone to the store in the last six weeks. We try to anchor the questions clearly to before this class, and today, but it's still challenging for young people. Also because the retrospective concept, the general concept of retrospect can be difficult for young people to grasp. To that end, we are currently testing different ways to introduce the survey with practice questions to give the students a clearer non-class related example to shape their thinking around the questions. We've tried things like before kindergarten, how good were you at writing your name? Today, how good are you at writing your name? And we've had some success with that, but the other scale, uh, which is along the lines of before you came to this class, how did you feel about, that has proven much trickier. So honestly, we would like to crowdsource some ideas. Um, if anyone can think of some good anchoring practice questions they'd like to share, we had intended to give you two or so minutes to jot down a couple of ideas and then have some people share their ideas when the two minutes are up, but uh, we would also welcome any emailed responses you would like to share. So please note our email addresses in the first and last slides and feel free to send any ideas our way. We would love to hear what you come up with. All told, Retrospective post then pre survey design is not a silver bullet solution to the very difficult problem of data collection and demonstrating impact among children. We are still working out some kinks, like how to explain the concept quickly and clearly, but for this program, the pros really do outweigh the cons. We have more valid data, we can be more versatile, we can adapt the instrument through the course of the class if we realize there's something really cool happening that we want to assess at the end. It consumes a lot less of their activity time, and it's much easier to analyze change within a single student. 
We don't have to match ID numbers. We don't have to throw out responses because we have a post but no pre or vice versa. And we're finally able to confidently talk about program impact in terms of change rather than just the final snapshot status report. So what do you think? Does this seem like something you could use? Does anyone have a program they think would benefit from this approach or any other questions we can answer with the time we have left or via email or phone conversation? Really, we would love to hear from you, your thoughts, your reactions, where you might find this approach useful in your own work and how you plan to use this information, if at all. So we hope you found some useful or at least thought-provoking information here. We've included some sources in case you'd like to dig a bit deeper or learn more about the information we've presented. We, of course, really hoped you would fill out the session evaluation, but since we're not sure how that's working in light of the new platform, we, again, welcome any emailed comments you would like to share. And finally, we would like to thank you for your time. We know you have a lot of choices for how you spend your sheltering at home time, and we thank you for spending it with us. So take care, be safe, and please don't hesitate to be in touch.